Welcome to Weekly News Highlights. South Africa has dehorned dozens of rhinos in three popular game parks, aiming to prevent armed poachers taking advantage of the post-COVID-19 crash in tourism to kill them for their horns. The exercise in Pillensburg National Park and the Mafagang and Botsolano Game Reserves, all northwest of Johannesburg, leaves the rhinos with horn rumps too small for poachers to bother with. A rhino horn sells for 60,000 US dollars per kilogram, more than gold. In East Asia, it is used in medicine despite containing the same key component as human fingernails. Dehorning is controversial, especially as it makes male rhinos vulnerable in fights, but horns are not essential for survival, and like fingernails, they do grow back. Hundreds of people flocked to a mosque in the Indonesian capital after the governor eased COVID-19 restrictions, including opening places of worship for the first time since mid-March. People are meant to stay a meter apart and have their body temperatures checked before entering. Mosques, offices, and public transportation are all required to maintain a 50% cap on capacity, although public transport resumed with more regular operations. Indonesia has been the hardest hit country in East Asia outside of China. While there has not been a national lockdown, cities have been allowed to impose restrictions, although they have not always been strictly adhered to. While cases have fallen off, analysis from the World Health Organization shows Jakarta does not meet its criteria to relax restrictions including a 50% drop in cases since the last peak, and a rate of infections below 5% of those tested. Jakarta's infection rate has remained above 10%. The Russian Ministry of Defense is preparing to launch the testing of the COVID-19 vaccine on humans. According to the head of Maine Military Hospital, around 50 volunteers were selected from the ministry staff members and were transported to the medical facility in the Moscow region. Currently, the volunteers are in for 14 days of quarantine to eliminate the risk of being infected with COVID-19 before testing begins. The vaccine is developed by the Russian Research Center for Epidemiology and Microbiology which expects the mass production of the vaccine at the end of the summer. As COVID-19 lockdowns ease in England, Londoners gradually returning to work find the look of their city has changed, maybe for the foreseeable future. Many of the capital's busier streets are now lined with sandbags and plastic barriers reducing the road width to allow for social distancing on wider pavements. With a vaccine for COVID-19 not yet available, it is unclear how long the current rules on safe distancing will have to stay in place. The government announced earlier that face coverings will be compulsory for passengers on buses, trains, aircraft, and ferries in England from June the 15th. While car traffic is back to almost three quarters of pre-lockdown levels, trains are currently only 10% full and buses outside London are running at about 20% capacity. However, usage is expected to rise as more people return to work in the coming weeks. Russian President Vladimir Putin approved a state of emergency in the Arctic city of Norilsk last week after a huge leak of fuel into a river and upbraided a senior official on television over what he said was a bungled state response. A fuel tank at a power station in the remote industrial region lost pressure on May the 29th and leaked 20,000 tons of fuel and lubricants, according to the investigative committee, much of which flowed into the river Ambranaya. At a televised government meeting to discuss the spill, President Putin said he was shocked to find out local authorities 
had only learned of the incident from social media two days after it happened and scolded the region's governor, Alexander Us, on air. The state environment watchdog said 15,000 tons of oil products had seeped into the river system with another 6,000 into the subsoil. The state fisheries agency says the river will need decades to recover. FIFA President Gianni Infantino said in a message to member associations on June the 6th that a financial relief plan to benefit all of football was in the final stage of preparation. The suspension of most of the games due to the COVID-19 pandemic has left many football associations and clubs with financial difficulties. However, Infantino stressed in his message that financial help would be made available for all levels of the game and not just the top clubs. Also being discussed by FIFA administrators is a way to achieve a more balanced solution to the increasingly crowded international calendar. Infantino reiterated that health of both players and spectators is the top priority as many leagues around the world resume. Hundreds of protesters and football fans waving Italian flags demonstrated in central Rome last week against the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Wearing protective masks, protesters called on Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte and his government to resign over the handling of the crisis and the resulting damage done to the economy and jobs. The protesters gathered in the ancient area of the Circus Maximus one of the ancient world's largest public entertainment venues. Conte announced earlier that Italy would receive some 20 billion euros from a new European scheme to mitigate the impact on jobs of the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. In Germany, players and officials of the German football teams Borussia Dortmund and Hertha Berlin knelt in support of the Black Lives Matter movement before the kickoff of their Bundesliga match. Players from both sides knelt around the center circle, while officials did the same on the side of the pitch to show support for protests that have taken place in the United States following the death of George Floyd in late May. The United Nations Environment Program, or the UNEP, has drawn attention to images of a snow leopard living in the mountains of Kyrgyzstan on World Environment Day to highlight links between humans and the natural world, increasingly under strain due to climate change. Footage released by the UNEP showed a snow leopard inspecting a camera trap in the Nabu Rehabilitation Center, jaws and all as well as footage of wild snow leopards and ibex. The UNEP said a new monitoring program had found 15 snow leopards in the mountains above the Kyrgyz capital, Bishkek. But scientists said the species classified as vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature is increasingly being brought into contact with humans by the climate crisis as farmers move to higher altitudes to graze livestock. The UN has launched a new program called Banishing Treasures, which aims to help local residents diversify their livelihoods and map livestock losses linked to snow leopards to identify hotspots where more can be done to keep the predators away. Liverpool will resume their quest for a first top flight title in 30 years against City rivals Everton on June the 21st as the Premier League released its revised fixture list for the first three weeks of the restarted season. Football in England has been suspended since mid-March due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but clubs have voted to restart the season on June the 17th when second place Manchester City hosts Arsenal and Sheffield United visit relegation-threatened Aston Villa. Liverpool are 25 points clear at the top and are two victories away from winning the Premier League. 
but will have a shot at securing the title by beating Everton if City lose to Arsenal. Other potential dates in the first three fixtures when Liverpool could clinch the title are June 24th when they host Crystal Palace and July the 2nd when they face Manchester City. The venues for Liverpool's games against Everton and City are yet to be confirmed. All the matches will be broadcast live but take place without fans in the stadium. Belgian Stoffel van Doorn won Formula E's virtual Race at Home Challenge for Mercedes last Sunday after finishing second in the Grand Final. The former McLaren F1 driver had started 14 points behind his German rival Pascal Werlein, but the final race around the Berlin Tempelhof layout offered double points, allowing a comfortable victory. The series features regular Formula E drivers competing on simulators from their homes and aims to provide some action for fans of the all-electric championship with racing on hold in real life due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It has also been fundraising for the UN Children's Fund UNICEF's global COVID-19 appeal. Formula E has yet to issue a revised calendar after halting racing in March. Hundreds of Venezuelans queued up in miles-long lines to try to fill their car tanks with subsidized gasoline over the weekend, a week after President Nicolas Maduro launched a new dual-price scheme aimed at easing an acute fuel shortage. President Maduro on May 30th announced a new system in which motorists could purchase up to 120 liters of gasoline at a heavily subsidized price of 2.5 US dollars per liter and 50 US dollars per liter thereafter. Some 200 gallon stations were designated to charge solely at the higher price. This new system effectively ended decades of unlimited heavy subsidies in Venezuela, an OPEC nation with the world's largest crude reserves where cheap fuel has long been considered a birthright. The new plan caused chaos and confusion at service stations across the country when it debuted on June the 1st. Maduro launched the new gasoline scheme after receiving five shipments of fuel from Iran, another US adversary whose oil sector is under heavy sanctions by Washington. But the government has not provided details on how much gasoline arrived through the shipments. Anti-racism protesters threw a bronze statue of 17th century slave trader Edward Colston into a river in Bristol last Sunday, after tearing it down as thousands demonstrated across the UK over George Floyd's death. Demonstrators were seen rolling the statue through the streets of Bristol and throwing it into the River Avon as they celebrated. In London, thousands of protesters rallied outside the US Embassy to condemn the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, with some wearing face masks to protect against COVID-19, bearing the slogan, Racism is a virus. According to London police, the protesters have largely been peaceful in the United Kingdom, but demonstrations throughout the week in central London have seen 27 police officers injured. Grasshoppers with yellow spots that destroy crops have been reported in four of Sri Lanka's 25 districts and authorities warn that the infestation of the local insects could be exacerbated by another species from India. Agriculture officials say that the local locusts are breeding quickly, perhaps due to climate change, and could result in large-scale devastation of crops. Banana, coconut, and rubber plantations have already been affected. They said operations were being carried out to kill off the grasshoppers, now as they are still young and do not have wings as once they mature. The wings will enable them to migrate and spread. Farmers are using mild chemicals and controlled fires to destroy the grasshoppers. 
India and Pakistan have also been plagued by locust swarms which have come from East Africa. Officials say they could come to Sri Lanka on an airstream and cause more damage. China announced last week that it will increase international cooperation if it succeeds in developing a COVID-19 vaccine and would make a vaccine a global public product when it is ready. China is expending efforts in the global scramble to develop a vaccine for the COVID-19 pandemic that began in the central city of Wuhan, with Chinese researchers conducting five separate clinical trials on humans. China says it will continue to push for fast-track border entry arrangements with other countries. It said it has fulfilled its responsibility as a big country through shipments of goods to help others fighting the pandemic. Germany's coordinator for transatlantic ties has criticized U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to withdraw thousands of troops from Germany. Peter Bayer, a member of Chancellor Angela Merkel's conservatives, said that this is completely unacceptable, especially since nobody in Washington thought about informing its NATO ally Germany in advance. Earlier, a senior U.S. official said that President Trump has ordered the U.S. military to remove 9,500 troops from Germany. Following President Trump's decision, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said that he regretted the planned withdrawal of U.S. soldiers from Germany, describing Berlin's relationship with the United States as complicated. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern declared that New Zealand has eliminated transmission of COVID-19 domestically and will lift all containment measures except for border controls, making it one of the first countries to do so. The Prime Minister added that public and private events, the retail and hospitality industries, and all public transport could resume without social distancing norms still in place across much of the world. The South Pacific nation of about 5 million people is emerging from the pandemic while big economies such as Brazil, Britain, India, and the United States grapple with the spreading virus. New Zealand vowed to eliminate, not just contain the virus. This means stopping transmission for an extended period after the last known case is cleared while being ready to quickly detect and isolate any new cases, including from abroad. Sources said that talks to end the 18-year-old conflict in Afghanistan may begin this month, a day after the U.S. Special Envoy Zalami Khalilzad visited the capital of neighboring Pakistan and met Taliban leaders in Qatar. The United States signed a troop withdrawal deal with the Taliban in February, but its attempts to usher the insurgent group towards peace talks with the Afghan government have been marred in setbacks and violence surged in March and April. According to the Taliban spokesman, Suhail Shaheen, Khalilzad has discussed the commencement of intra-Afghan negotiations in Doha. Meanwhile, the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad said that Khalilzad had earlier met Pakistan's Army Chief of Staff and the two took note of recent progress created by the Eid ceasefire and accelerated prisoner releases, as well as reduced violence ahead of the intra-Afghan negotiations. French Interior Minister Christophe Castaner assured that no institutionalized excessive use of force exists in France amid a recent series of police violence protests that have sprung up in the country. Speaking at a news conference in Paris, Castaner also called for zero tolerance on racist acts by police officers, adding that a systemic suspension will now be implemented against perpetrators. Since last week, several French cities have seen demonstrations echoing the anti-racism message following the death of George Floyd in Minnesota, Minneapolis by the hands of a police officer in the U.S. The French protests are calling for justice 
in the killing of an African French named Adama Torore, who died in 2016 during a police operation. Many have likened Torore's death to that of African American George Floyd. Tropical Storm Cristobal brought heavy rains to the southeastern United States over the weekend before making landfall in Louisiana. Cristobal is packing winds of 50 miles per hour and could cause flash flooding along the Gulf Coast. Several towns have ordered mandatory evacuations and declared a state of emergency. The National Hurricane Center urged residents to be careful given the sheer size and scope of the storm. Cristobal moved through Mexico last week, causing heavy floodings as rivers overflowed and residents in the Yucatan Peninsula found themselves wading through the streets. Military jets bombed several villages in rebel-held northwestern Syria in the first such airstrike since a Turkish-Russian deal produced a ceasefire over three months ago that halted major fire. The strikes hit villages in the Jebel el zawiya region in the southern part of Idlib and two towns in the Sahel el khab plain west of Hamma province. Civil defense groups said two civilians and several others were injured in strikes conducted by Russian jets that flew at high altitudes. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights also made a statement saying that Russian warplanes had launched around 15 pre-dawn strikes on towns and villages in Idlib. Family and close friends gathered in Houston on June the 9th for the funeral of George Floyd two weeks after his death at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer. The private funeral took place at the Fountain of Praise Church where the service was live streamed. Floyd's death sparked protests and rallies globally to demand addressing the problem of inequalities against the African-American community. Meanwhile, the former U.S. police officer charged with the murder of Floyd has appeared in court for the first time. 44-year-old Derek Chauvin appeared via video link at the Hennepin County Courthouse in Minneapolis, Minnesota, almost two weeks after he was arrested over George Floyd's death. Chauvin is charged with second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter, and his unconditional bail amount was set at 1.25 million US dollars or 1 million US dollars with conditions. The three other officers who were at the scene of Floyd's death were charged with aiding and abetting second degree murder and second degree manslaughter on June the 4th. Lamine Diak, the former head of athletics governing body, arrived in court in Paris to stand trial on charges of corruption, money laundering, and breach of trust linked to a Russian doping scandal. Prosecutors allege Diok solicited 3.45 million euros from athletes suspected of doping to cover up the allegations and allow them to continue competing, including in the 2012 London Olympics. He has previously denied wrongdoing. His lawyers have said the accusations are baseless. Diok from Senegal led the Governing International Association of Athletic Federations, or the IAAF, now renamed World Athletics, from 1999 till 2015, and was amongst the most influential men in the sport. He lives under house arrest in Paris and faces a jail sentence of up to 10 years if convicted. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and his ministers held their first face-to-face -face cabinet meeting on June the 9th since the lockdown to fight the COVID-19 pandemic was announced on March 14th. Spain, which has suffered one of the world's worst COVID-19 outbreaks, imposed strict confinement measures in March but has been gradually reopening its hard-hit economy since May, with different regions progressing at different speeds. Earlier this month, 
Spain reported 48 new cases of COVID-19. The total number of cases reported since the outbreak and up till Monday is 241,717, with 27,136 people losing their lives to the virus. Daily infections and deaths from COVID-19 have plunged since their peak in early April, but medical equipment is in short supply. A trainload of goods from China is expected to arrive by the end of June. In Hong Kong, dozens attended a peaceful lunchtime rally in the Central Financial District, marking one year since a massive rally that sparked months of pro-democracy protests. Supporters of the movement say their feelings on the anniversary range from hope to fear. Last year, organizers said a million people hit the streets in a city of seven and a half million, where the courts are controlled by the Communist Party. The Hong Kong government eventually backed down on the legislation, but the protest had evolved into calls for broader demands. Now, authorities in Beijing are drafting national security laws that activists fear will further curb freedoms in the city. Police said almost 9,000 people were arrested in relation to protests over the past year and more than 600 were charged with rioting. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Ishtai warned that Palestine will stop the recognition of Israel if the Israeli government implements its plan to annex Palestinian lands. The Prime Minister explained that the international community understands the Palestinian leadership's abolition of agreements and understandings reached with Israel because the world knows that Israel has individually made this decision to annex the Palestinian territories. Meanwhile, Ishtaya affirmed that the Palestinian side has fully stopped all coordination with Israel, covering economy, health, and security. President Donald Trump pledged to maintain funding for police departments in the United States amid growing calls for sweeping cuts to law enforcement budgets as protesters demanded an end to police brutality following the death of George Floyd. The statement, coming after demonstrators' anger over the death of George Floyd, is giving way to a growing movement to make his case a turning point in inequality and policing, with some protesters and some liberal Democrats calling for police budgets to be slashed. Attorney General William Barr said federal law enforcement understands distrust of the criminal justice system and acknowledged that for most of U.S. history, the law was discriminatory. The White House press secretary said President Trump is taking a look at various proposals in response to Floyd's death, but offered no specifics as to what measures he was considering. Hong Kong police arrested 53 people during protests that saw hundreds of activists take to the streets, at times blocking roads in the heart of the global financial hub before police fired pepper spray to disperse crowds. The protest, called to mark a year of sometimes violent rallies in the former British colony, also came amid heightened tensions due to a proposed national security bill backed by the central government in Beijing. Protesters had defied a ban on gatherings of more than eight people introduced by the Hong Kong government to prevent the spread of COVID-19. More protests are planned in the coming days, with pro-democracy supporters fearing the proposed national security legislation will dramatically stifle freedoms in the city. The Quaid Red Crescent Society distributed prayer rugs, masks, and hand sanitizers to the worshippers in several mosques and several governance after they opened as a precautionary measure to confront COVID-19 outbreaks. Director of the Youth and Volunteers Department in the Society, Dr. Musaid El Anezi, said this initiative comes in the context of efforts to support the various state agencies in facing the pandemic. Dr. El Anezi praised the role of the Ministry of Awqaf and Islamic Affairs and its cooperation with the Association. 
to preserve the health of citizens and residents, appreciating the great efforts of the political leadership to limit the spread of the virus in the interest of everyone's safety. That's it for tonight. Join us again next week for more weekly news highlights.